running sci-fi channel right now. Um, it's hard because sci-fi is a difficult audience to cater to in some ways. It's quite diverse in the sense of the kinds of programming it wants. You know, a lot of folks just they just want the 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 shows. They just want you know to watch Star Trek over and over and over again. Um, and there's some that want analysis, and there's some that want you know just a wide variety of stuff. Um, but if it were me, if I were in charge of the movie division of that, actually, I would say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to fund a bunch of high concept, low budget sci-fi movies. So you do not get a lot of money, but we don't want an action movie. We do not want a thriller. Um, or more accurately, like we don't want a sci-fi horror movie. We don't want a monster movie. There can be a monster in it, but it needs to be more thoughtful, more highbrow, um, and a little more high concept, a little more weird. And I think if you did that, you know, some of them are going to fail, but instead of having a bunch of things that are kind of down here and kind of sort of make a little bit of money, you know, they're, they're probably going to, most of them are going to do worse, but you'll occasionally get a spike of something, you know, kind of like an arrival where people are like, oh my gosh, yes, everyone should watch this thing. And it seems to me that's more likely to eventually result in something folks will care about. Solaris, but not as long. Exactly. And in fact, I would, I would take that, that kind of filmmaking, uh, Game Escape, great, great point, as the starting point of saying, let's take um, you know, some of these intellectual sci-fi concepts that are still basically you know, people in a room talking and do those and do those sorts of stories, do those sorts of movies. I think that would that would be great. Um, I've seen the original Solaris Russian film, and it, it's an acquired taste. Um, but there's there's some interesting stuff there, and I think that's yeah. I would do something along those lines. Um, um, and again, you can do it fairly inexpensively, um, and you can say if you want to do a monster movie, do Alien. You know, do a movie where. You rarely ever see the monster. It's really all about the psychology of being hunted. Yeah, I mean, you know, Sci-Fi Channel was my jam. I spent a lot of my free time watching Sci-Fi Channel back in uh, back in the day. And let's we forget, not only not only did they get Solid Snake in the Giver, they got Luke Skywalker. Um. That was that was pretty impressive stuff. Outer Limits, Master of Horror series, yeah, and of course Saturday Anime Block. I mean, that's one of the things that turned me into an anime fan. Was there was that block, and that was a really great way of doing that, where it's not like they suddenly licensed twenty anime series and tried to make a, a big deal out of that anime. They said we're going to just show one movie a week, right, or one or two movies a week, and they'll be off here on the side of the schedule. And if you want to watch it, you can. It's going to be there, but we're not going to be, you know. It's no heavy investment. Um, and then with their festivals of anime, every... One second. There we go. With the festivals of anime every uh, every summer, that gave them the, the opportunity to add new shows, movies, and OVAs to the cycle. That's a good question. I do not know if they still do the Twilight Zone marathon. They should. That was a, that was a long-running thing that they did. Yeah, they're doing interesting stuff these days. I mean, obviously, The Expanse... Um, and from what I understand, they, they dropped the expanse mainly because they had only licensed it for like the first two or three seasons and it was getting really expensive. And so as I understand it, sci-fi, it's not that they hated the expanse and wanted it off their network. It was, you know, they wanted it on their network, but just kind of, you know, their contract was up and it was, too, and it was really expensive. So they were like, you know, we would like to, but it just kind of didn't, uh, it, it, it didn't work out and they just weren't willing to fight that hard for it. Um, and then there's, um, gosh, um, there are a couple of other TV shows they're doing that, um, I happen to quite like, um, that have been going for a couple of seasons. So some of their shows have kind of, have, have found a way, but there's a lot of other weird stuff on there. Um, you know, part of the difficulty is you look at a show like Westworld, you know, Westworld should be on the Sci-Fi Channel. Obviously, there there are content problems there, um, but 
you know, that that is a classic uh, concept for 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 that where you have, you know, in, in terms of budget, you have office rooms and you have this old west town. And I, there is a world where you could make a much less expensive version of Westworld and where you know, when you work on the, uh, uh, the robots, they're not naked. Um, but where you could totally do that as you know, a sci-fi channel TV show. Um, yeah, and you know, Netflix is certainly stiff competition where Netflix can, can, and HBO can snap up these high concept shows and also you know, Netflix and sci-fi can say, hey, if you want the nudity, if you want the violence, you can just do it. And there are no content restrictions on here. But. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Sci-Fi Channel is responsible for a large swath of anime fandom. I mean, a, a large amount of anime fandom would not be here in that sense, where it was either, you know, fans from today who got into anime back in the Sci-Fi Channel or, you know, um somebody back then who got into it who is the older brother of somebody brought got them into anime now but that was, that was a very important attack vector for anime back in the day yeah that's a good point I think um, yeah how how could maybe this is our debate topic how could the sci-fi channel succeed I, I do think the sci-fi channel should be investing more in anime um, yeah, well, you, you look at Comet. You know, Comet Television, they're, they are a sci-fi channel. They are the sci-fi channel, basically. It's, it's funny. Comet TV now is basically the sci-fi channel in, like, its first year, where it's a lot of reruns. It's a lot of older shows that air at 3 p.m., um, but they're building up the catalog, and they're, they're, they're getting more and more interesting stuff. And, you know, I, watch, I would watch Comet all, the day, all day. Um, as opposed to Sci-Fi Channel, because Sci-Fi Channel is just so scatterbrained. Um, but there's some really interesting stuff on Comet. So yeah, I mean, if I were Sci-Fi, I would carve out that niche of saying basically, you know, you're going to find, and they're, they're kind of doing this now with some of their, their shows, where you go for that more... I don't want to just say original programming. Maybe that is the thing you do. Maybe for Sci-Fi Channel, you have to risk it all and you say, look, you know, HBO and Netflix, they're licensing stuff, but they're tending to, uh, Westworld's based on, on an existing property. Uh, Comet's got all the retro stuff. We're going to make new things. And we're going to bring in a bunch of stuff and we're going to, you know, get George R.R. R. Martin to conceptualize a new show. Uh, and we're going to get Neil Gaiman to conceptualize a new show. And everything's just going to be new, and we're going to just kind of, uh, uh, you know, do that. In fact, what I what I might do is I'd announce that and say, look, we're not going to do it all at once. We can't afford to, but you know, next year we're going to roll out six new shows, and we'll see how well they do over the first season. And one of them will become will be, will be Farscape, and one will be um, what was the the anthology show they did? Welcome to Paradox. You know, which ran for, I think, one or two seasons, and it just kind of never really got its audience. And they're like, okay, that was a useful experiment. It'll go on reruns here and there, um, but that's not going to get a season two. Um, I don't know how you, th how you see Gaiman as goth. There is very little goth in Gaiman. <laughs> Those two things do not intersect at very many points. Um, but yeah, you can do some really interesting stuff. I mean, yeah, imagine a Sandman sci-fi uh, TV series. Um, Sandman would be great, I think, for cable TV, where obviously you, know, you can't do the, the, the nudity, um, but Sandman isn't really dependent on the nudity. You just do that, that, that show. Um, Sci-fi buzz, I think, is what you're talking about, Fisher. Um, that I, I totally agree. I think that would be a, a great idea, 
would be to do something like that. And they did a couple other other uh, uh, sci-fi news shows, but that was the, the big one I remember. Um, and I think that would be a, a really neat thing is to do a couple of, of these sort of magazine style shows where it's, uh, you know, you're doing a, a, um, you're just kind of covering what happened recently and you can pull in stuff. I mean, you know, they're getting, you know, they're getting tapes from movies. They're getting a B reel from movies. So they're, they're going to have plenty of material about what's going on and they can just, you know, churn stuff out. It's basically what Sci-Fi Buzz did, and do you know do an anime show, do a manga show, do a sci-fi and fantasy show, do a horror show, maybe not horror, horror, and I don't know how much I don't know if there's half an hour's worth of horror material every single week. Um, but then you you could do a thing where, and I've always wondered why they did, you know they didn't do this, you know, do a fifteen-minute fantasy show and a fifteen-minute horror show back to back. And it's you know it's it's produced and made as a half hour show, but they are two distinct set of segments, and people know that when they're tuning in. Okay, if I want the fantasy stuff, I st I tune in early. If I want the hard stuff, I tune in late. Um, I mean, the bigger question, as somebody brought up earlier, do you know does it even really make sense to push TV anymore, or are we all just watching it streaming? Right, is streaming killing television? But yeah, I think it's a really good point, Fisher. I think one of the ways you bring the, that fandom back, whether it's anime or manga fans or sci-fi fans or fantasy fans, would be, would, would be to do that light programming where you're saying, hey, here is stuff for you. Here is news about this. Here is, here's commentary. Here are reviews. That would be really interesting. Um, and like I said, you, you could, I mean, with a significant, a sufficient staff, you could totally do that. Um, and it would be awesome, actually, to do something where you, you have those different segments. So, you know, there's, it, maybe it's a half-hour segment, and it's, you know, here's the sci-fi segment, the fantasy segment, the anime segment. And you can just kind of fill it out that way. Um, yeah, that would be, that would be really interesting. But... I mean, maybe that doesn't make sense. I don't know. It's hard to see where cable's going to go in the sense of with the internet, it's hard to imagine a real necessity for cable channels, um, for any sort of linear programming. Um, yeah, no, totally. Um, uh, exactly. Um, envelope antelope. There's, you know, very few people are actually collating that sort of news. Electric playground. Cool. Um, yeah, exactly. And that, that's the thing, Fisher, is that if you're doing that kind of a show, you can feature the weirder stuff. You can feature, you know, Walk On Girl. Uh, you can feature Memorial Hosoda's films, where it's like, they're family films, but they're clearly not aimed squarely at kids. Um, and you can actually talk about that stuff. You know, you could you could talk about Ghost in the Shell, or you could talk about you know whatever. Um, and I think that would totally work. Well, you look at what Funimation and Crunchyroll are doing with some of their their content. You know, where Funimation has a show, uh, Crunchyroll has a has a regular show where they talk about this stuff. And the problem with that is it's kind of you know they're obviously corporate mouthpieces. Um, and that's nothing nothing against people in the show. It's just. You know, what, they're going to spend the time on the shows that they actually have licensed, um, you know, naturally, because that's what they have access to, or easy, most easy uh, access to. So you're only getting a, you know, a slice of the pie as a result. Um, and yeah, it'd be, it'd be awesome to, see, to have them go back and say, okay, here's, here's this really provocative, adult-oriented thing that came out this past year. Let's do a little roundtable. Let's, let's dive into it. Um, and especially these days, you know, you can you can do that on Skype, right? Pull in a couple of people, pull in a, a Helen McCarthy and a Thomas Lamar, and some folks, and just have them all have a debate for you know seven minutes on your show, and there you go. I mean, if you know, if I could, 
I would totally have this Twitch channel running anime 24-7. You know, I would just be, you know, showing episodes of, of anime. I would, I actually probably have enough anime, you know, that I have bought that I could stream, you know, and, and we, it would take a long time to get through all that, all that material. And, you know, and then I'd, I'd produce a couple of shows a week about here's, here's what this is, here's, you know, here's all this. I mean, heck, I'm, how many, how many hours of original material, uh, you know, video am I producing per week now? Um, and that's with a, you know, full-time job. Um, you know, it seems like something you could actually, you'd actually do just, you know, I can't do it because of the whole little licensing thing. But yeah, it's, it's tough sci-fi channel. They, there is a lot of, and it, it's also hard because sci-fi fans and you know, spec fic anime fans, etc. We tend to be the uh, some of the most technologically uh, literate people out there. So we know how to get to the streams. We know how to to access this stuff without needing to watch a cable uh, service. So even if sci-fi channel is doing cool stuff, a lot of us are just going to download it off BitTorrent. Um, you know, a pirate bay or whatever. Um, you know, th there's going to be less appointment TV, so to speak. Uh, that's a good point, Game Escape. I would say, actually, also just how does licensing affect creativity? Because it doesn't just limit it, it also, you know, improves it. Um, yeah, no, totally. Um, I mean, there, there is some amazing old stuff on there. Back in the very early days of Sci-Fi Channel, they would just show short films late at night. And so when their regular programming ended, they would just show, like, there was a, a wonderful little uh, short film made in England uh, set, I don't know, around the turn of the century. Um, uh, this sort of proper British uh, guy walks over to his neighbor's house. He's just moved in, and there's this little girl there and he talks to her for a little bit and what's going on and she's talking about uh, um, you know, her, her father um, who um, yes, where her father is and she goes, oh, I don't have a father uh, because he went out and he um, went out you know, like a year ago uh, hunting and uh, hunted some strange creature and, and died. Um, but they say every so often that you can see him in you know, walking around, uh, walking the fields. And the guy sort of turns very pale. And then they hear rustling and they look over and walking out from, of the fields is this guy with a gun um, just returning from hunting. And she goes, it's father. And the, this, this guy, you know, freaks out and he runs off. And the father comes in and, and, and sits down and the rest of the house comes out and sits down and he, they all just start having tea. And the, the guy says, the, the father says, Who's that? And the girl says, I have no idea. And you realize she made it the entire thing up. Um, you know, her father's alive and well, but she just invented this whole story over the course of several minutes about how he died and he's a ghost. Uh, and he shows it just to freak out the guy. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of these, these fun little segments that they would show. You know, early CGI experiments and demos they would just show late at night. I just love that stuff. Like they, did, they did a whole show just with short films, where they would just premiere short films for half an hour. That was awesome. I'd forgotten about that entirely. In fact, I was going to make a short film for that show. Um, I had it all planned out, but then it, it required use of a Cowboy Bebop song, so it really wouldn't, wouldn't have worked. Um... Yeah, it's a good point, Envelope. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to debate something where it's like, what if there were no licensing? Well, you know, what if everyone owned a, a, you know, a Lamborghini? Um, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine a world where everything's radically different. Um, we could certainly talk about that, about just what licensing, what licensing does, the, the impacts of that on the industry. Um, yeah. And granted, you know, this is nostalgia speaking. Uh, you know, I love that stuff, but that stuff is not commercial. That stuff is not going to bring in your fans. It's going to bring in me, but it's not going to bring in the kinds of, the, 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 the number of people that you need 
to keep a cable channel running. Um, you know, some things succeed more than others. Yeah, yeah. And there are a lot of short, uh, uh, short films out there. Again, the problem there, there comes with licensing, of, of tracking down the original creator and making sure it's okay. And again, a lot of the problem there is not so much that it's you know, hugely expensive or hugely complicated. It's that you know, they're owned by a huge number of people. You know, each one is owned by a different person or group or company or whatever. And you have to talk to a bunch of different people to, to make that happen. It's why so many cable channels make their own content. Because then they don't have to worry about, um, you know, it's just much less work to track all that down. You know, with the Mystery Science Theater, you know, usually licensing the movies wasn't hard. It was just finding a movie, licensing it, you know, picking the movie, and then going through the process. But then, like, like I was mentioning earlier, when they went to DVD, it's like they have to, you know, if they want to do a DVD pack of four, uh, four episodes... Those are four different companies they have to talk to, four different licensing deals they have to, to reach. And even if their standard is just four times the work, then if there wasn't all of this other content mixed in there. Um, it's a, also one of the reasons why a lot of these channels are tend to do sort of package deals. So Comet, for example, I believe is Universal. It was started by Universal, um, or one, one of the big film companies, because they have this big library of of old stuff, and so what they're showing is stuff from their library, right? And that just makes a lot of sense because they own all of it. Hey, Kamenoko, good to see you. But, yeah, it's, it's tough. So we're talking about the old sci-fi channel days and how we would, it, how we would fix sci-fi channel, so to speak. It, it is hard. The, the, the new media landscape is definitely different. Um, certainly, I would go more intellectual. I would go more thoughtful. Um, I'd probably go more hard sci-fi and do more stuff that is, you know, less fantastical. Um, actually, if, I, if it were me, I would also do some fantasy. I'm surprised we haven't had more shows trying to capitalize on, you know, Game of Thrones and doing shows like that. Um, obviously, less necessarily, you know incest uh and sexual violence and and uh that kind of stuff but like there seems, certainly seems to be a hunger for political fantasy stories so why not do that especially because you find the right places and it shouldn't be that expensive to make um you know you're gonna have a fairly small number of of locations uh people don't have a lot of different changes of clothes and the whole appeal of the show is it is people standing around talking, right? So, so I, would, I would invest in a couple of those and just try to do something along those lines. Um, I'd also probably do a few parodies, you know, do a do a and d parody show, um, something along those lines. Um, no, you're absolutely right, yeah, and a lot of these things are just, you know, held by owning com uh, 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 holding companies where they just have this big, massive set of things and trying to work your way through that, that bureaucracy is complicated. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Yeah, I, I still don't know why folks haven't jumped more on the fantasy bandwagon to make those sorts of shows, um, especially because you can do things like, like Earthsea, um, like good examples um actually the robin Hobbs series there, you know, there's a lot of fantasy that's not doesn't have wild magic in it where you know there's not dragons flying over all the time it can be much more um you know grounded realistic and you know an occasional magical spell effect but it's much more about the people talking but i also love to see just more of that that serious sci-fi sci the the thoughtful hard sci-fi um, and again, partly one of the one of the conveniences of that, and they, they learned this in anime with with shows like Gundam, is that if you have a consistent universe, then it's in a lot of ways easier to write for because you have these specific rules, as opposed to having to make up drama and make up, you know, um, 
make up solutions to problems because you haven't defined how your universe works. Oh man, NARS are going to be hugely expensive, but I would I would be there minute one for an adaptation of Nausicaa. Um, I can't imagine trying to adapt that, trying to, you know, th that would just be so ugh, expensive to do live action because so much of that is, is done, you know, in and around the forest of corruption, the sea of corruption, you know, there's so many weird uh, creatures. Wow, but it would be awesome. Like that would be, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Epic in every sense of the word. My gosh. That's a great point. You know, imagine a story kind of like Nausicaa, but without the, the, the ridiculous, you know, uh, uh, aggressive fauna. Um, but the same kind of, you know, the, the, in fact, you could, uh, you know, you, you could take a few pages from Nausicaa's plot and have, okay, we have this kingdom here, small kingdom here, large kingdom comes in, they have some big magical artifact, and uh, they happen to sort of crash land on, in a small kingdom. And you could, you could use this, the same basic plot points, tell a very different story without requiring all of that stuff. Um, yeah, make it very visually, visually remarkable. Um, yeah, for D&D &D parody, so if I were doing a D&D &D parody, I'd be tempted... See, the classic thing to do with a D&D &D parody is to show the people playing the game and then to show the actual fantasy world version of that, right? What actually happens in, in the game and kind of bounce back and forth between the two. The problem is you're now making basically two TV shows, right? You have to hire and cast and, and make sets and do all that stuff for the, for the real world stuff plus all the fantasy stuff. So it's really hard to do that, you know, right and, and to do that you know, without breaking the bank. Um, but I would love to kind of, maybe what I would do, eh. so my ideal would be you start episode one and it's entirely real world. It's entirely just them playing the game and talking back and forth. And then episode two is entirely set in the fantasy world. And it is what happened in that session. Um, and there's no reference back to the real world. It is just that plot. And then episode three, you're back in the real world, and it's all of them talking back and forth, and there's references to this is what happened in the last session, and this is what we're playing here, right? And, you know, I, I do it that way, where it, it's less kind of tightly integrated, uh, and there's kind of that separation. And so then you, know, you, could, you, could, you could say, you know what? I like this show, but yeah, I really like the fantasy stuff, not the real world stuff, and I'm just going to watch those episodes, and that is a, a, an entertaining show in its own right. Or you can go with the other one or see how they kind of bounce back and forth. Um. <laughs> yeah. And that's kind of one of the other frustrating things is it's like there is so much great spec fic out there that you can't get into. Again, partly just because, I mean... Imagine trying to get the rights for 2001 and Blade Runner and all the Star Trek films and all the Star Wars films. I mean, we all can imagine our ideal sci-fi sci you know, channel and all the shows we put on there. But the sheer amount of trying to get all that working, I don't know. <laughs> 